Uh, in my talk, I will walk you through the synergies that we will be able to explore with the LISA mission and uh, uh, all the other uh, studies of our galaxy that has been developed so far. And uh, I had a short video about Lisa, but actually Chiara has already uh, covered most of the uh, well uh, details of the mission that uh, I wanted to mention. So perhaps just to uh, complement uh, what she has already said, uh, I, I would like to remind you that the mission has been approved um in 2017 since then until now the the lisa mission was in the phase a meaning that we were wor working on the details of the of the mission design so currently we have already a preliminary mission design and uh yeah starting from next year early next year the mission will move in phase b um in which we will start uh, uh, adopting this, this design. So in two years from now, the, the mission will be set and will go in production. And from, uh, from that time, uh, it takes uh, around 10, 10 years to, to build the mission. So the launch is set around 2034. But that date, uh, I mean, uh, it can be moved by uh, plus or minus few years. So take it with a uh, grain of salt. And uh, as, as Chiara mentioned, uh, the, the design uh, of Lisa lands her in, um, in the millihertz frequency range uh, that is very rich uh, in astrophysics. And uh, just to mention uh, some advantages of, of, this, uh, uh, of this band, uh, Lisa can see black holes of all astrophysical, astrophysically relevant masses. So from uh, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, uh, down to stellar mass black hole detectable uh, by LIGO. Lisa can see uh, gravitational wave sources from our galaxy up to a high redshift and even uh, well, uh, uh, early universe and cosmology that Gara uh, explained you. Uh, Lisa can detect uh, extreme mass ratio binary, so supermassive black holes with uh, stellar mass objects uh, that can be not only black holes, but also stars. Uh, and those are called the extreme mass ratio in spirals. Uh, Lisa can see um, uh, not only black holes, but also stars, so white dwarfs, for instance, and neutron stars in binaries. And finally, the uh, the advantage that I would like to, to highlight is that Lisa can uh, explore our Milky Way in the same way as, uh, as we do now uh, with the um, electromagnetic telescopes. So you have uh, already seen this plot today. Uh, and uh, if you uh, heard about any synergies or uh, multi-messenger topics, you have uh, probably heard about supermassive black holes and LISA. And I will focus today on these uh, purple points in the middle that are um, galactic stellar binaries. And uh, even if they are maybe uh, less um, renowned for their synergies, uh, I will try to convince you that uh, there is a lot of uh, interest in science that can be done with galactic binaries. And uh, I will actually focus only on one aspect of it, but the, uh, there is many, much more, and we can discuss this uh, um, later. Uh, so just to show you what are these galactic binaries, uh, firstly, the most numerous will be uh, detached double white dwarfs, uh, and you see um, here the numbers are the expected rates. And uh, Lisa will see mainly this sort, this type of binaries because of the IMF, of course, favors lower mass stars, and because these stars uh, evolve on very long time scale, so up to even uh, a Hubble time. Uh, we will see them in detached, but also in a creating configuration. So uh, when they get uh, close enough and uh, uh, the bigger star uh, starts uh, transferring the mass, and these are typically called I am uh, Canum Vanaticorum. 
uh, yeah, and basically these are two white dwarfs uh, 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 in a cretin binary. Then we will see also this very special type of binary composed of uh, either neutron star or white dwarf with the helium star companion. And uh, it is a, a special binary because helium stars are not the generate stars. So they're still burning um, fuel in their core, but they're compact enough because they, are, they have been stripped out of their hydrogen envelope so they can get close enough to emit uh, gravitational waves in, uh, in the LISA band. Uh, and then of course, uh, double neutron stars and uh, double black holes. And we can also see all sorts of mixed systems with the rates that roughly uh, will be between the, the rates that you uh, see here uh, for the double compact objects. And uh, from now on, I will focus on, uh, on the double white dwarfs. And this is because they are the most numerous, so I can use them to, uh, uh, to explore the Milky Way. Uh, and up to now, uh, we know uh, more than a hundred of, of these binaries uh, discovered with the optical telescopes mostly. And about 20 of them uh, we know that are detectable by, by LISA. This is because we can measure their, their parameters from electromagnetic radiation. And this is where they land on the um, HR diagram. And this is in the, in the Gaia band. So here you see the, the main sequence and the white dwarf sequence and our galactic binaries are here above the, the white between the main sequence stars and white dwarfs. And this is where they are in the sky. So currently this uh, sample is uh, biased towards uh, Northern hemisphere and uh, mainly to, to large uh, high galactic uh, latitude. So uh, this is the galactic disk and uh, this is its uh, width. So most of the binaries are uh, sitting above the disk and this is because it's just uh, too crowded and too difficult to, um, to explore with, the, with optical um, uh, surveys. Uh, and this is how we see them with the electromagnetic radiation. So uh, here you see examples of their light curve. So here we, uh, we look at the, the photometric variation, so variation of the flux uh, folded uh, in the orbital phase. So uh, with the recovered period and you see periodicity. So this is an eclipsing binaries, binary and we can um, well, measure it orbital period, radio, uh, radio of these two stars uh, from the white dwarf mass radius relation, we can recover the masses, we know its location, uh, and uh, in some cases we know the distances. So all that we can fold and recover the gravitational wave strain, that is the amplitude of gravitational waves and the frequency. So we can uh, already say where are they in, the, in this gravitational wave frequency amplitude uh, plot and you see the, the current error bars. But moreover, we can also observe these binaries over long period of time, uh, years or decades. Uh, in this case, I think it was, uh, yeah, well, it, probably it's uh, something like a few years and we can see how the orbital period uh, changes with time. So each point here is the measurement of the binary orbital period at a different time, at a different epoch. And we can see how the orbit decays uh, due to gravitational wave radiation. So these are, we know that they are guaranteed uh, gravitational wave sources because we already measure their gravitational waves indirectly. And uh, <clears throat> here I would like to show you some prospects for the for Gaia and uh, the future Vera Rubin Observatory. So here I've taken um, a simulated mock population of these detached white dwarf binaries. I um, simulated their light curves just as, uh, as in the previous slide. And I've checked whether these telescopes with their uh, cadence can recover binaries, uh, well, can detect these binaries uh, uh, as eclipsing. And what I found is that, uh, well, 
um, that Gaia will deliver something like a few hundreds of these binaries and uh, uh, Vera Rubin Observatory, something like a few thousand. So this is the potential uh, of discovery of these binaries between now and, and LISA. And uh, this uh, histogram showing you more or less what will be, what will be their periods uh, distribution uh, for this for this detection method. So through eclipses, and you can see um, Vera Rubin in uh, hushed uh, and Gaia in purple. And uh, well, the the peak of this distribution is around a couple of hours. And this is intrinsic of the uh, um, eclipsing uh, binary search method. I was very surprised by the previous transparency about being able to detect gravitational wave emission. Yeah, uh, is... Well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm amazed. These guys are quite non-relativistic, right? And still, mm -hmm. and yes. you cannot time them. I mean, with pulsars, it's like really you have this. So here, the precision is because you have very precisely seen the eclipse or something. Yeah, yeah, you recover very well the, the period of the binary. And these guys are actually orbiting um, like 20 or less minutes. So uh, we, we see lots of their uh, orbits, uh, epochs, and uh, even uh, through a few years of, um, of time observation, one can already, well, uh, recover this, uh, the decay. And this is exactly the same as the binary, uh, Nobel Prize binary, binary pulsar. Uh, so now I will um, move to, towards LISA and I will show you how many binaries LISA will detect. Oops. So uh, as I uh, showed you earlier that the current sample of observed binaries is, is biased, so it's difficult to use it uh, to predict LISA observation directly based on observed binaries. So uh, until now, uh, we uh, often use this technique called binary population synthesis and binary population synthesis. This is basically a code that uh, compiles recipes for different stages of the binary evolution and stellar evolution into one um, pipeline. So for a given initial distribution of uh, main sequence binaries, it uh, gives you then the final distribution of the desired binary. So in this case, we're looking again on double white words. And this is the outcome of a, a binary population synthesis code uh, called SIBA. Uh, and here we are looking at the, the period distribution versus mass ratio. Uh, so the, uh, the underlying gray contours are the density of uh, is the density of the small binaries, and the uh, black points are the, the observed binaries at, at the time. So this is just to show that we try to when we predict and uh, simulate this binary, we always try to to compare to observations. In this case, important parameter for us is the is the mass ratio. Uh, then given uh, a mock population of binaries, we have to place it in a, in a galaxy. So, uh, and you can do that in uh, different ways. So one can use uh, analytical uh, potentials. One can use um, uh, hydrodynamical simulation or cosmological simulation. And uh, here uh, you can do all, all of these options and the, the choice depends on what would you like to probe. For instance, if I want to study the galactic halo, uh, I would go for a cosmological simulation that uh, actually designed to, to reproduce that. And if I want to look at the, for instance, galactic bar and spiral arms, I would go for hydrodynamical simulation because it is again designed to, to reproduce that features of the Milky Way. And finally, we also need a star formation history. And this is to uh, just uh, to, to know where in time we want to place our mock binaries. And again, you have some choices, uh, empirical uh, functions. Uh, this case is chemo spectrophotometric uh, model simulation uh, that uh, combined the simulation of gas um, 
stars and, and dust. Uh, and that you see the result in uh, star formation history. Or if you are already using a simulation that produce a star formation history within it, you, you can rely on, on that. And the final step is to, to simulate LISA data. So again, this has been already mentioned. These binaries uh, um, evolve uh, due to gravitational waves on uh, uh, extremely long time scales compared to uh, LIGO binaries, right? Uh, of the order of thousand and million years. So their uh, waveforms are can be considered almost monochromatic, and we can add to it a small linear drift in frequency. And that waveform is uh, fully described by eight parameters that I list here. So uh, it seems easy. However, the, 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 um, the challenge here is that we have many of these binaries. So the Milky Way, given its mass, uh, star formation, and uh, um, the binary population produces tens, actually tens of millions of, of these binaries within the LISA band. So we need to model millions of those signals. And uh, uh, because LISA is not uh, Lisa is, is all a sky survey uh, observing the, the galaxy at all times, all th those signals will be overlapped. So we need to actually also be able to disentangle uh, each of the tens of million signals uh, one from, uh, from another. So this is uh, one way of doing it. And here we are looking at the frequency versus um, uh, spectral density. Uh, the instrumental noise is the black dashed curve and uh, the gray forest of lines is our input population. So I take the, uh, the, the, the population that I produced with those three steps uh, from the previous slide and uh, I'm now showing you its spectrum. spectrum. So now what, uh, what one can do is to smoothen the spectrum and uh, um, compute a sort of a median and, to, and then compare if you have any of the bright sources above the median and you remove them um, from your catalog, considering them as detected. And then you can continue and continue and to repeat this step uh, a few times until you reach uh, to, to a situation in which you have no more spikes above your, uh, your median spectrum. And this is a sort of a, a shortcut uh, to, to analyze these large populations of, of binaries that allows, uh, allows me to do, um, to do this fast and to do this in, uh, uh, well, many times. Uh, as opposite to the detailed Bayesian uh, param um, searches of, of the gravitational wave sources with detailed uh, parameter estimation. So those are, um, would be the ideal uh, situation, but um, given this large dimensionality of the problem, if you want to do uh, quick studies, um, yeah, you, you have to overcome this. Um, however, within the, the LISA uh, consortium, of course, there are groups working on the building this, um, the full Bayesian simulations and uh, global fit of the LISA data that contains all these binaries, but also all the other LISA signals. So this would be our ultimate goal uh, to have um, before the LISA flies. So with this shortcut, um, I will show you what is the, the final result. So this is the, um, an example uh, of a catalog that has been produced with um, uh, hydrodynamical simulation. Uh, so the, um, combined with the binary population synthesis outcome and the, the green, well, blue, uh, green, yellow points here are uh, detectable LISA binaries. So those binaries that uh, above our threshold and that we mark flag as detectable. Uh, and as uh, you can see already from, from this plot, um, LISA data has a great potential to, uh, to map the Milky Way because we can, well, besides uh, seeing well the features of the simulation, we can um, go uh, up to the central region of the galaxy where typically, for instance, optical observations are very challenging because of the dust and crowding. 
and we can see also the opposite side uh, of the Milky Way as well as the as our side. And here I would like to, to compare um, Lisa to Gaia. That will be one of the uh, biggest surveys uh, even in 2030s. And please don't take this comparison too seriously because of course here we are comparing apples and oranges because the two surveys ha have very different selection effects. So uh, of course Gaia see enormous amount of stars. However, what I want what I wanted to show you is that those stars are typically confined um, to our side of the galaxy. Uh, and this is because electromagnetic uh, observatories are measure um, fluxes. So um, the signal scales as one over distance and in gravitational waves, we measure directly the amplitude of the waves. So the, and the signal scales as one over distance um, sorry, here one over distance square and here one over distance so we can cover uh, larger uh, volumes. Uh, so the idea now is to use this uh, uh, double white dwarf binaries detectable by LISA as tracers of the, of the stars of the stellar uh, matter in the Milky Way. And this is because, uh, well, firstly, they don't experience kicks as black holes and neutron stars. So we believe that they um, trace the, the true stellar density. Uh, I showed you they are numerous uh, between, well, tens of thousands uh, should be detectable by LISA as individual sources. Uh, this plot shows you that we can detect them everywhere within the Milky Way. From uh, for many of these binaries, uh, we will be uh, able to measure the, the distance. And this is for those that have um, uh, the highest uh, uh, chirp in their signal. Uh, however, those will be still thousands, if not all of these binaries, uh, they will be still very numerous. And this sample compared to other galactic tracers has uh, in principle no contamination. So if you um, uh, think about uh, other tracers like main sequence turn of stars, red giants, often uh, astronomers have to first clean their sample and to make sure that uh, there are no um, imposters in there. In this case, uh, we don't have to do that because any uh, monochromatic galactic gravitational wave source in principle will work in the same way as, as double white dwarf. And now I would like to show you uh, what we will study with, the, with this sample. And to sort of uh, give you um, uh, where I would like to, to end. Uh, here I'm showing you our current measurements of some of the Milky Way um, parameters. So the, the Milky Way total mass, uh, this uh, disk scale height and disk scale radius, and uh, the um, bars axis ratio and orientation. And here I don't want really to, to discuss any of this measurement. I just want you to look at the, at these plots uh, all together and to notice that there is a lot, well, there is spread in all of these panels uh, and there is no clear agreement. And this comes mainly from the fact that uh, all each of those points that represent different measurement or different technique uh, relies on a, uh, on a specific stellar tracer. So <clears throat> measurement can have some biases. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I will focus on this too, sorry. <clears throat> so this is the <clears throat> the exercise <clears throat> that I I've did with um, one of those mock Lisa catalogs to prove that we can uh, recover the shape of the Milky Way disk and um, and bulge. <clears throat> And basically what, uh, <clears throat> let's look at these two plots. What you can see here is the number density as a function of the distance. 
on the top, you have <clears throat> Lisa detection being in spherical shells. So these are the, the points with the arrow bars. And on the bottom, you have Lisa detections being in the cylinders. So again, the, the, um, the purple points. And what I did is uh, taking this um, mock measurement, I tried to fit the same model that I used to produce this population in the first place and to, and to see whether I can recover back the, this, the structural parameters that describe that, um, that density profile. Uh, so here, <clears throat> for instance, I was able to recover the, the bulge scale radius and then the <clears throat> disk scale radius and the disk scale height. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and then on top of this, I also showed you that we have some electromagnetic um, observations of the same binaries. So here um, I've taken those that have uh, that are both detectable with LISA and also with electromagnetic surveys like Gaia and Vera Rubin. And I've computed their uh, circular velocities in the galaxy. So again, the black points are the, the mock measurements. And the, the black solid line is the, the profile that, that, that I use to generate this, um, this measurement. So <clears throat> now, um, together with the density profiles, I can also try to fit this, uh, the rotation curve uh, that has been constructed uh, by um, combining gravitational wave distances and um, with the electromagnetic parallaxes and uh, velocities that I have recovered from a simulated proper motion. So the motion of the star across, across the sky provided by Gaia or LSST. So now if we feed both um, rotation curve and the density profiles, on top of the structural parameters, we can also recover the, the masses of the bulge and the disk. Um, and again, uh, doing this simple proof of the com uh, of the proof of the concept exercise, we showed that uh, it is possible to um, combine um, very basic gravitational wave measurements with the electromagnetic measurements to, to fully characterize the, the, the Milky Way uh, potential. And this is, of course, uh, synergetic with the electromagnetic measurements and tracers that I showed you before. <clears throat> and now uh, we can come back to the, to the previous simulation in which that we used because we were interested in looking in the Milky Way um, bar and uh, spiral arms. And here we asked ourselves whether Lisa can, can recover those. Uh, so, and we decided to do this analysis uh, by applying a Fourier transform to the density of the green points here on the map. So I will walk you through these two plots and I will try to explain what they signify. So when you apply a Fourier transform to the to the density to this density profile, um, first thing that you look at in which uh, um, in which mode is the dominant. So the zero mode in this case would be the total mass uh, of the of the galaxy. Then the the M two mode would be that uh, in which that would tell you that you are um, you have a bar like um, signal in the, in the data, and the, the next mode would show you, for instance, M4, uh, something like a cross um, in, the, in the density distribution and so on. So here uh, I'm showing you the M2, which is the most, uh, um, the dominant mode, and we look at it at the amplitude as a function of galactocentric distance. 
And what you see here again, black points are the simulated data, and the blue uh, profile is the is the underlying density distribution in this uh, in this simulation. So first thing that we can notice is that the the, the blue yeah the blue uh, line and these points follow each other until up to five kiloparsecs or so. Here uh, we are. Uh, the data becomes noisy. But basically, what this first peak represents is that it's the Milky Way bar. So the, the width of this peak represents the, the length of the, of the bar. And the slope of, the, of this peak represents uh, Milky Way's bar, um, ax bar's axis ratio. So this is what we, we have attempted to recover here. And when we look, when we are looking at the face, again, as <clears throat> As a function of galactocentric distance, you can notice that until here we have this constant uh, phase that is an indicative. <clears throat> Sorry for this. That basically provides us the, the measurement of the bar, of the bar lens, <clears throat> and this is what we recovered. Yeah, so this is not this is simulated data, right? So, <clears throat> and the time scales I wish you recover. So, imagine that something is transient, uh, like generating a relatively motion of the gravitational field of the of, of the galactic center. So, which is the time scale that you you need to to do these measurements? So here I'm, I'm not looking in time. I'm just looking at the. Um, well, let's stationary bar. Let's say, but if the bar ah, is yeah. dynamical. No, that's true. Um, okay, we haven't looked at that, but uh, right there we have only four years of data. So um, the reason I ask is because in some dark matter models they claim that in the center of the galaxy there will be a kind of solid tonic structure oscillating, and um, yeah, if you can start. <laughs> to pin down this yeah that would be also cool yeah so thanks for suggestion and uh, indeed we we haven't looked at the time variations but um yeah maybe it, it is a good uh, direction to uh, to follow okay so uh, so far we have explored the milky way and uh, um, now I, I would like to show you actually how far we can see these binaries. So uh, to, uh, to remain in the, in the white dwarf reg regime, let's look at the, the blue light, light blue lines here. And what we are looking here is gravitational wave frequency versus the luminosity distance. So these curves are showing us that the horizon distance for uh, this sort of binaries at the given frequency. So our white dwarf binaries are, <clears throat> if they are below one solar mass, we can see them basically, if they are uh, above two millihertz or so, um, everywhere within the Milky Way virial radius. And if they are more massive, we can go even beyond uh, somewhere halfway through the local group. So this is uh, then uh, was uh, the next um, uh, topic that um, I wanted to investigate are the, the nearest satellite galaxies of the Milky Way and whether we can say something about them uh, with, uh, with LISA. So again, to, to assess that, uh, we, uh, well, first, let's look at the biggest Milky Way neighbor, the Large Magellanic Cloud. And here, again, we're trying to assemble a, a, a mock uh, LISA, LISA data. And to start here, we, we used an observed star formation history. So here we are looking at the LMC. And in each of these uh, squares, we have a measured star formation history uh, that comes from optical observations with the Hubble Space Telescope. So we took all of those. Uh, and since this is, a, of course, in optical, uh, often you have only the, the two dimensions, right? We wanted to have our model three-dimensional. Uh, so we took um, 
a numerical simulation of the of the LMC, and we combine this these two so that now it has an observed star formation history and the distribution that comes from a, a numerical simulation, and we pass it through the same LISA pipeline that I showed you before. So this is what we recover. In total here, we have something like a, a few hundred of, of detections, individual detections. And uh, they are uh, all shown here with the, some ellipses uh, that you might not be able to see, but most of these ellipses are very small. And that is the error uh, of the LISA sky location for this binary. So we are looking at uh, very high frequencies. So orbital periods of less than 20 minutes. And in that regime, uh, we have um, a good sky localization with LISA that goes uh, below um, degree uh, square. Of course, not as good as with electromagnetic observations, but you can see that we uh, can see the same structure. So actually LMC, uh, we will be able to look at it as, as a resolved galaxy with, uh, with LISA. <clears throat> Um, and now, of course, uh, what about all the other satellites? And here, uh, instead of modeling them individually, uh, I'm constructing some sort of a typical uh, satellite in which I uh, model, in, in which I vary its total stellar mass and the distance. And I take several star formation histories. Uh, so what you can see, the contours here in the color, uh, gives you the, the number of, of detections in the, of resolved binaries in, in this a theoretical satellite. And this green line shows you the one detection contour. So it um, outlines the, the region in which we have at least one detections. And in that region, we have the two Magellanic clouds, Sagittarius, another big satellite, and uh, some others that... Uh, are not shown here. But basically what, what we um, showed with this exercise that if the, uh, our satellite is above 10 to the six uh, solar masses, it can generate detectable LISA sources. And if it's uh, uh, close enough, let's say 100 uh, uh, kiloparsec, uh, a bit more, uh, we can detect those uh, binaries with LISA. And of course, uh, well, we can use, I will show you how we can use the LISA detections to, to learn a bit more about the satellite, but this is also has a potential of discovery um, of, yeah, discovering new satellites. Uh, for instance, if um, the satellite is hiding somewhere where it's not accessible with optical surveys. Uh, <clears throat> And this is a complementary exercise that we did in which we, uh, we take all the known satellites and those are the stars and points on this plot. The uh, orange uh, contours are the, the Milky Way foreground. Um, okay, and then um, the stars are the satellites in which our fiducial source has been detected. So this exercise has done with the full Bayesian um, uh, source search and parameter estimation. So um, <clears throat> as opposite to the method that I showed you before. Uh, so this is why we used only a, a fiducial source because we could repeat it for a limited number of times. So all the stars are the satellites uh, that where the source, our fiducial source has been detected. And the stars with the um, circle around is where um, our uh, theoretical study predicts more than more, more detectable binaries than the foreground. So these uh, satellites can stand out uh, in the LISA data as over density of the um, of, uh, monochromatic gravitational wave sources. And this is basically the, the sky, uh, the local sky as Lisa will see it. Uh, so the, the last, uh, uh, the last study that I would like to show you is what what we will do with the Lisa binaries in in the satellites, and this is very simple um, uh, exercise again, where I take from Lisa only the number of detected binaries and the distance. And the distance I actually can also know from electromagnetical observations. 
And I showed you, I have a bunch of models to generate, uh, to that predict how many binaries, um, uh, how many binaries can satellite with a certain age and distance from us uh, generate for uh, for a solar mass. So then I can construct a, a Bayesian um, inference um, model in which I I feed my number of uh, of detected sources at a given distance and I look. Uh, for instance, what mass uh, was needed to generate that number of observed binaries. So this is the, the posterior contour. In, the, in this case, our true uh, satellite was the orange line. So the true, uh, sorry, star formation history. And we were able to recover the true mass um, within, uh, within a factor of two. And the, the other uh, contours here showing you that the wrong star formation history. So even if we don't know anything about the satellite and its star formation history, we can still marginalize over all the models and recover a measurement of the mass. And the same uh, we can do also, um, the same uh, procedure we can apply also for the cases in which we have no detections because this method can predict what is the upper limit of the satellite mass. And of course, whatever we recover should be uh, analyzed in synergy with the electromagnetic estimates. So to conclude then, uh, the ultimate uh, synergy that I would like you to, uh, yeah, to take home is that, uh, well, uh, in the LISA era, in 2030s, we will be able to have uh, our to explore our Milky Way through the all electromagnetic wave bands, and we will be able to add a gravitation wave uh, map to this um, uh, collage. And uh, this will be possible because LISA is an all uh, sky survey uh, that will deliver a number of guaranteed results that I mentioned you in, in this presentation. And I will conclude now and leave you the detailed conclusion. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice talk. And now we have time for, I guess, one question. Okay. So, yes, very, so another thing you can do with these binaries is since they are going to be distributed in the galaxy is to to probe the Navarro from white profile, I guess. So the dark matter halo, which normally is like a global fit of, of data. But here, I wonder if you have studied how much info about the dark matter halo you can get from those guys. <laughs> so <laughs> we, through it, we can do that, but not directly, right? Because these are stellar tracers. So we can uh, design some sort of um, Mm, well, yeah, well, if we leave the uh, Navarro Franklin, what, if we leave dark matter hello as unknown and we analyze the known, the stellar part, uh, but it, I mean, we don't trace it directly, but it can be, uh, well, included within the model, of course, yeah. It, it just not, will not be direct measurement. And also the generacy between the parameters there, uh, we will not be able to break. Yeah, but that's the way it is measured today also in the Milky Way. You have, you take all the data from stellar motion in the Milky Way, you do a global fit, and then there is some, no, and then people claim that there is one uh, GV per centimeter cube of dark matter on Earth. That's based on this model, for instance. So you have more data, it's better. Yeah, thanks for, for the suggestion. I think that the, the problem with the, with the, with the, the methods that uh, recover now, right? And it's the same, as long as you use stellar motions, you look at the rotation curve and it's pretty much flat. And that means that a lot of the parameters describing all these curves are degenerate. And uh, well, it is, a I mean, it's a good method of tracing uh, a dark matter halo, but uh, it's, uh, it has a lot of degeneracies as well because of the flatness of the curve of the rotation curve. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much for the nice talk again. And our next speaker will join us through Zoom, Francesco Carol, if she can hear us. Yeah. Can you hear me? 
Uh, yes, and just one minute for the screen. Yeah. I do it for. Okay, uh, can you share your talk with us? Can you share the screen? I'm trying to. Let me. Multiple participants can share the screen. Let me check. Okay. Should be good. Can you see my screen? Yes, we see it, but can you make it full screen? Yeah, sure. I'm just. Do that now. Can you see the full screen? Yes, yes, it's all fine. And Thank my you. cursor moving on it? Yes. Okay, well. fine. I will keep okay. the camera as long as my uh, internet connection allows me. So otherwise, I switch the video off at a certain point. Okay, thank you so much. So we're happy to have now Francesco Calore to tell us about cross correlating galaxy catalogs and gravitational waves. Please go ahead. Thank you. So uh, thanks. Uh, I'm uh, here actually because Tanya Rijimbo couldn't attend. So uh, I will take over uh, her slot and uh, present the work that we have 